So the question for this session is the question about what is the future of health? And I would say, first of all, that the future of health is going to be one of the major innovations in the next couple of decades, that there are so many currents flowing down this valley that it's impossible to summarize them all in this one little short take. But needless to say, um, there will be many, many changes in our health and how we benefit from technology in creating wellness and health. Without a doubt, artificial intelligence will be a key element to that, but there are many other ingredients in thinking about and what will make us healthier in the future. I like to think about the many, many benefits that the quantified self approach will bring, which means basically measuring our bodies, measuring our minds, measuring ourselves all the time. So um, a lot of the advances in medicine have come because we have data, we have experiments about it. But unfortunately, that data is still very, very rare. Most people may only see a doctor, maybe not even once a year, and collecting data from that one visit is a very inefficient and very unrepresentative look at ourselves. If we're able to actually monitor and sense ourselves and our bodies in a continuous basis all the time, we have a tremendous amount of information that we can use to better our health. And that approach, quantifying ourselves, um, is not something that we have to have other people do, it's something we can actually do ourselves. So we can, we, as a consumer, as a citizen, we can actually engage in monitoring our own selves to collect some of this data. Now, the collection, collecting part is actually the easiest part, but we have many technologies that will allow us to do it. From motion sensors, like the Fitbit, where it's actually just registering our motion, and by measuring our motion while we sleep, we can get some idea of how well we sleep. By measuring our activity during the day, we can see what our heart rate is, we can see what how active we are. Um, but we can also measure other things by um, our temperature, our skin response. There's many other non-invasive ways that we can easily start to inspect ourselves. And we haven't even begun to explore all the ways in which we can do that. But we know um, that there are many ways. And um, besides wearing things, and wearables is one of the big categories where we can actually um, wear something on our wrist or on our neck, on our ankle. But we can also have begun to do it using clothes where we can actually put something on. So it's a wearable in the sense that we're wearing clothes, wearing a hat, we're wearing shoes that monitor our motions, our activities, our blood pressure. And these wearables are one of the key sources in the future for this data about ourselves. It's our posture. It can actually detect our emotions. It can detect whether we're depressed. It can detect our health, our mental health. It can, it can detect our overall health. Um, we can use it in many ways to um, not just measure us, but also in some ways for us to modify ourselves. Because if we have instant feedback about our posture, say from a shirt, if a shirt could tell whether we're sitting up straight, it could nudge us in certain directions with a feedback loop suggesting that we sit up better or have a better um, uh, posture with our legs and it can actually guide us these wearables as well. There's also ways in which we can use these technologies to scan us in a, a more thorough way. Um, there's new innovations in ultrasound, which is no longer just kept in the doctor's office, but actually can be made and put into a phone or connected to a phone where we'd have the ability to ultrasound, or if you can imagine a bathroom, maybe a mirror, a magic mirror that would look at you when you looked in the mirror, it's gonna look at you and scan an ultra scan of you on a daily basis. That interior view is very, very powerful. That's, there's a lot of potential information there. So 
Um, that's the easy part in some ways, just collecting that information, measuring ourselves. Um, it doesn't really do much, and it hasn't done much to now, because we need artificial intelligence and other ways to extract meaning out of it. There's so much data that, in fact, it's actually a detriment to making decisions from. We haven't had the extra layer of an AI observing this, and manipulating and digesting this information to actually derive some meaning from it and to give us actionable directives, actions that we can actually use. So that's where the AI comes in, is that it's the necessary interpreter of all this data that we can actually pretty easily collect. Among the other kind of data that we can collect that is becoming very, very important is, is the information about our DNA. And there's a couple of companies now and that um, will do a genetic survey of your own genes. My wife actually works for one of those, 23andMe. And the idea is, is that you spit, take some saliva, and you can do a map of your genes. And a lot of the genes in all of us are genes that we have functions that we don't know. But there are some genes that we've identified that are correlated to certain traits, certain diseases. And as we know them every year, we know more and more, they can be conveyed to us, communicated, and we can have either something we should look at closer or other things that we should avoid or other things that we actually need to do something right now about. And um, the more people that participate in this, the more information there is, the better that, that, that becomes because there's, there's correlations that are needed that can only happen once people do this. And so in the, very, in the beginning, the value of doing it is not as great, but the value of doing this, of having your gene sequence become greater and greater, the more other people do. Because we have more correlations between the genes and what actually people's bodies do. So, so once you have your self-sequence, the value of that actually increases as other people have their sequences done. And so um, the value from having your genes sequencer is so high for the, your health in the long term that I believe that we will sequence babies at birth. That every baby born will be sequenced and will immediately begin to look at that, their gene and um, identify things that should be this should be of concern early on in their life and things that may not be of any concern to them until they're much, much later. But the more we do that, the more value we will extract as a collective, as a society from all that, because there are many things in health that we can't really see on an individual basis. We can only see in terms of a collective and aggregate or as the public. And having uh, DNA from birth will become extremely powerful in being able to extract out the maximum data for everybody involved. So, um, again, like lots of things, a lot of this data that we get from DNA is, doesn't really make sense to us, and we're going to need AI, ubiquitous cheap AI, to actually process it to understand some of these correlations between the gene and what we see. Um, but there are other ways in which we're going to use this big data and AI, and that's going to be with an AI doctor. Now, what we know from, say, doing diagnosis with an AI, or having a chat with an AI, is that AIs are not anywhere near as profound, accurate as a doctor is right now. But unlike a doctor, an AI is awake 24 hours, never tires, and could be present in the most remote village of Africa, whereas a human doctor won't be. So while a human doctor is still superior in some ways over an AI, an AI doctor is better than no doctor. An AI doctor is better when you have no doctor on call, when you have no doctor within 100 miles. If you can have an AI doctor, that is huge. 
And so AI doctoring, the AI doctor will become incredibly important, mostly to people who don't have enough doctors right now at all, or access to doctors. And that includes even developed countries that don't have access to it when you really want one. But more importantly, I think the model for us to understand doctoring is that um, already the big secret is that doctors Google medical information all the time. There was actually a recent paper about how doctors are watching YouTube to see how surgeries are done. There are sometimes surgeries that they know how to do, but they're looking at how other people are doing them to learn. Or maybe they're looking at some new procedure, some new variant that they don't, that has never been done before, and this is the way of disseminating it. But the point is, is that doctors are using the internet as an assist to make themselves better doctors. And that's the model that we're going to use with AI for the most part. Even, even the best human doctor is going to assist, have an assist with an AI, whether that is an AI that's going to help him diagnose something or her, or uh, um, uh, an AI that will help them understand, or more these days, even uh, an AI that will assist them in surgery. So robotic surgery is a very, very fast moving area where um, a robot can either assist a human surgeon or even take over certain aspects of that surgery, in some cases, even to perform the entire surgery. And um, it works because a lot of surgeries are very specialized. And if you restrict the field that they have to become expert at, you can actually become have them become experts at a very tiny um, field, which is often what you want in a surgery where they're just doing that same surgery over and over again. Again, they don't tire, they're not distracted, they're very consistent. And so um, robotic surgery is one area that we're going to see more and more of. And again, I think a lot of it's going to be robotic assisted surgery working with the surgeon, maybe doing some ties or other aspects of it that they may be able to do faster, better, or cheaper than a doctor could. We're, I can expect also that we'll do more of visits to doctors, not just physically, but also in kind of a virtual space and augmented reality space where um, we don't need to go to their office. They can come to where we are, where we can, in, we can meet in some um, third place. And um, already right now, doctors who do boutique, um, you know, concierge kind of medical attention, doctors who are available to high-end, high-worth individuals who are available any hour of the day, it turns out that those people who can have a doctor anytime they want, the doctor won't make a house call. The, they don't ask for house calls. They send doctors photographs, pictures, and text. They, they, the, and, and that's good enough for them. And so I, I fully expect that a lot of the doctor-patient relationship that we will have will take place in the spatial world. Because for most purposes, that will be good enough and it will be quicker than, than even that person waiting for the doctor to come to their house. So that arena of the mirror world, of the spatial computing, I think is going to be a very, very key part in this healthcare in the future. Ultimately, what we really want, of course, is that we want to have um, all the research in the world, all the doctoring, really give us a very personalized individual custom um, treatment, right? I mean, we're all individuals. We feel we're special. And in fact, our bodies are a little different from each other. And so even though we have a science where the, where the um, tests, phase one, phase two, clinical trials are done at very large scale in order to prove that they won't hurt most people, in fact, we don't really care about most people because we care about ourselves. Will this drug work on me? What's the effect? What are the side effects on me? What's, and I don't care whether the drug works on anybody else. I just want it to work on me. And so we have this N1 idea that, well, what we really want to have is we want to have therapies, treatments 
that we know will work on you. And um, so sometimes we take that genetic information about yourself and we're going to be able to kind of calculate based on how maybe people with related genes work, um, whether this is going to work on you. But we also can do things like um, what they call 3D pill printing, 3D medicine, printing medicine, meaning that all it means is that um, you can get your medicines if it's something you take early. And through the quantified self, we can measure the effect of that before we give the next dose. Okay, in other words, it's like, okay, so normally the way you give that pills is you give someone a pill, you take this pill for every day for a month. Maybe it's working, maybe it's, it doesn't. Nobody really knows until the end of the month. But in fact, with quantified self and these other technologies we're talking about, you could take a pill, measure the effect of it, and then you can adjust the dosage the next day and you get a different mixture or a different dose depending on what you had the previous day, and you take that and then you measure your body does quantify itself and with the aid of the AI and doctors, you actually have a new dose and you can measure day by day, dose by dose, how it's affecting you and optimizing the effect on you, optimizing your own wellness just with that much faster feedback loop. So those are things happening right now that will be happening even more in 20 years. Some of the things that are, again, further out, the future frontiers, this idea of regenerative tissues, where we're learning how to print, 3D print tissue, okay, not just plastics, but actual tissues. If you want an extra kidney or part of a kidney, we'll actually grow that stem cells, other kinds of techniques will actually make you or have your body make and regrow that extra part by finely tuned instructions saying, okay, right here, we're going to, we're going to regenerate something that you've lost through disease or injury, and we can actually regrow it. And that is very, very exciting. It's very closely related to the immuno immunotherapy where you're having your body fight the cancer by just triggering the right things in your own body. So rather than having introducing poisons into your body to kill cancer, you can have your body do. Your body knows how to do it, it just needs some extra help, some extra nudging, some extra protection. And so we can actually, again, trigger your body to do that, to regrow things, to fight against in your immune system. And that is one of the most exciting parts of technology and the future of health. That's a little further out. It's much more complicated, but that is one of the things that we see on the horizon of 20 to 30 years. So I think it's a very, very exciting time. I, I haven't talked about the far future genetic engineering, you know, test tube babies stuff. That's way, way, way beyond. That's not in 20 or 30 years. That's 100 years or more. Um, but we have plenty still to look forward to in the next 20 or 30 years. Um, and I think it's going to be a very, very exciting time for the future of health.